When ChatGPT first came out, universities were panicking. They were trying to decide if using ChatGPT was cheating. Would students stop writing their own essays? And what about take-home exams? But with the rise of AI, there's even bigger questions like, what's the value of a college degree if you can simply ask ChatGPT for the answer? So as I was going through some of my own class binders from my bachelor's degree in food science, which by the way, for years, my mother has tried to throw out, I thought up a little experiment I wanted to try. I created test questions to see just how well does ChatGPT know the vast realm of food science. And if us food scientists are in danger of being replaced. My plan is to test ChatGPT at three different levels of food science. I want to start off easy with a class I took as a sophomore. This is just a basic food science course. From there, I'm gonna get a little trickier and test ChatGPT on some junior level food chemistry. And finally, I'm going to end with the most difficult set of questions, which are also on quite a niche topic of confectionery sciences. So let's start out with my first ever food science class, which was named Introduction to Food Science and I have kept highly organized in this binder. I'm just kidding, I hate being organized. I like a little bit of chaos. But in this class, it was really just a quick overview of different topics from proteins, carbohydrates, fats, to food microbiology and food processing. So let's get into it. First question, coming up. I'm going to ask ChatGPT why we formulate foods to a water activity of 0.85 because we do this for a very specific microorganism and that microorganism is Staphylococcus aureus. So that's the answer I'm looking for. Okay, okay, not off to a great start. So ChatGPT said uh, Clostridium botulinum. This isn't a terrible guess, I will say, because Clostridium botulinum, like Staphylococcus aureus, is a toxin producing microorganism it is also found in food and it can also make people sick. But where ChatGPT went wrong is it's not the reason we formulate foods to a very specific water activity of 0.85 or below. So I'm gonna say this is wrong. I was looking for a staph aureus. Let me paste in the next question. So what are the four stages of the bacterial growth curve? Which if you don't know, this is what the bacterial growth curve looks like. So the answers I'm looking for are leg, log, stationary, and depth, which that is exactly what ChatGPT wrote. So it has my four phases correctly and it described each of them. So uh, this is a good answer. I, I really like this answer. Next is what's the definition of hurdle technology in the food industry? So if you're a food scientist, you know this, it just means you use multiple preservation methods or factors to make sure a food is safe. And yeah, that's exactly what chat GPT typed up. So what I like about this answer is that it lists some of the important factors. So that's the temperature, the pH, the water activities, the things we would want to control. But it also says almost exactly word for word what I said earlier, which is that hurdle technology is using multiple hurdles that can be combined. So this is a very good definition. Let me ask it about the two types of rancidity we see in frying oil. And the two keywords I'm gonna look for are hydrolytic, which, yep, okay, it's right there, and oxidative. Now, let me read about each of these. So it's saying hydrolytic occurs when a triglyceride is cut up into a glycerol back road and free fatty acids, that's great. Uh, in the presence of water, exactly. The only thing, that I would knock it for in this answer is it doesn't mention that enzymes usually are what cut up these fat molecules. So something like lipases is usually responsible for this. And I always want my students to remember that enzymes are what do this. So I would knock it for not getting all the key points about hydrolytic rancidity, but it looks, it did, it looks like it did a good job describing oxidative rancidity which has to do with unsaturated fatty acids, usually when they're exposed to oxygen in the air. 
So I just don't fully like the hydrolytic rancidity definition, but the other parts of the answer I think are quite nice. This will be the last beginner question, so I wanna try something a little trickier. I wanna try a calculation. And I'm gonna paste in a mass balance. So I remember first learning mass balance questions uh, in this class and I hated them. My friends and I could not get the hang of it. We thought this was so annoying. But basically all I'm asking is if we have two ingredients, we have a yogurt and a puree, sort of how much puree do we need to add to get to a final sugar concentration? Dang, dang. It told me the exact amount of fruit puree that I would need to add, which is the same answer as I calculated by hand. According to my math, that's four out of five questions correct. Remember, it just gave me that wrong microorganism. And I'm pretty impressed. It seems like ChatGPT has a good, very broad overview of the discipline of food science. It seems to know all the information you might find in like a textbook or handbook. And if you ask questions that have a very clear right or wrong answer, it is able to like regurgitate back what is the correct answer. Now let's see how ChatGPT does on a higher level and a more specialized topic like food chemistry. Hey everyone, it's me and Jazzy here just reminding you if you're enjoying this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Food chemistry, here we go. This was a very challenging class. First question is about proteins, asking if all the covalent bonds in a protein are single bonds. And the correct answer is no, because one's a partial double bond. So ChatGPT replied yes, that they're all single bonds, which like I said, is wrong. Uh, I think what happened is this is actually a very tricky question. It's a higher level question, not a basic question anymore. But I think why ChatGPT struggled is that in a very basic level course, you would draw out a protein as if they're all single bonds you have to have a higher level course or higher level knowledge to know that. That's kind of the lazy way to draw it and there's, that there's actually a resonance structure or a second structure that is possible where there's a double bond, not between the uh, carbon and oxygen, but between the carbon and nitrogen. So both these structures are possible and that's why we say there are uh, there is a partial double bond. So they're not all single bonds but I'm not sure that chat GPT can pick up on that sort of nuance. Let's try a slightly different topic. Why are crystalline fats polymorphic? So polymorphism is just means that several different crystal forms can be made from the same fat. So let's see, oh, it is typing me a long answer. Uh -huh. Yes, okay, so even within the first paragraph, I have what I was looking for, which students also do this too. They know the answer and they write me like an essay. It's like, no, just give me the answer. All right, let's get into proteins. So I'm going to ask it about the structure of some proteins from milk and wheat and what they have in common. Uh, I don't know how this is gonna go. Uh, it did a really good job. So I wanted, I was looking at it, had they both have a high proline content, even though they're from different sources because this proline content allows having a lot of proline means that protein can be a very random coil. It doesn't have a lot of secondary structure. Uh, that's pretty crazy. Getting into some formulation, I want to ask why a food scientist might include a protein versus a low molecular weight surfactant in a foam. And that's because there's pros and cons to each of those ingredients. So it's kind of a comparison. I see part of the answer here, proteins form more stable foams. Uh, that's because they can form like a coating and interact with other proteins to protect that uh, air bubble. But I don't see the other answer, which is why you might wanna use a surfactant. And that's because surfactants are better than proteins at lowering interfacial tension. So I'd say maybe half of this question is right and the other half is not there. There is a lot of like, nonsense or fluff or a lot of extra stuff in this answer that isn't like what well, isn't answering the question that I asked uh and I think for students especially a junior level student sifting through what is actually true in this answer versus what is not could be very difficult all right so the last question 
I made it on my least favorite topic when I was in this class, which was about the glass transition, is if we have lifesavers and they are in the glassy state, but we notice, you probably noticed this, if you store them under humid conditions, they actually become really sticky and crunchy. So if we don't want this to happen to this candy, which of the ingredients should we add? I have sucrose, maltose, trehalose, and gave chat GPT their glass transition temperature. Uh, let's see how this goes. Ah, uh, no, it nailed it. Yeah, yeah, it nailed it. It says right in like the first sentence, you should choose the disaccharide with the highest TG glass transition temperature. And this is trehalose. 100%. Yes, absolutely. If you're not keeping count, that is three out of five questions correct. So slightly worse than the questions we asked on the basic food science principles. This doesn't convince me that chat GPT will be able to do your homework in upper level food science classes like your junior and senior year, unless you want a pretty low grade. And I think we're starting to hit some of the limitations of ChatGPT, right? It doesn't have a deep expertise of food science. Its knowledge is more very broad, but shallow. We will test this hypothesis because my senior year, I took a even more niche class, which was called confectionery science and technology. Basically candy science, which sounds super fun and it was fun but it also was so much work and such a difficult class we are going to start with a question about sugar syrups because that's where we started in the class so i'm going to ask i have a sugar syrup how do i make it darker in color and what two chemical reactions are responsible for this okay wow quite a long answer so wow this isn't exactly how I would expect a student to lay out uh, this answer. It's a bit odd to me, but what I was looking for is the chemical reactions are carbonization and Maillard browning, which you can find in here, but uh, there's a lot of other information. And then to make it darker, yes, use higher temperatures or longer time. Uh, so like the correct answers are within chat GTP's answer. Uh, but I know specifically what to look for. I, I would not have expected to see an answer like this on an exam, but I, I can find what is correct. All right, the chocolate is next. So I want to ask about cooling chocolate. So when you're making chocolate, what happens if you cool it too quickly or at too much of a cold temperature? What's gonna happen to the cocoa butter? And is there gonna be any defect or quality issues with this? What I'm looking for in this answer is that the wrong polymorph or the wrong version of the crystal will form and that we then get chocolate bloom or this whitish gray surface of the chocolate. So let's see here. So I was talking about the unstable polymorph is gonna form, that's what I said. And down here has chocolate bloom. So this answer, yeah, I'm happy with this. This is good, correct. Okay, let's talk about a real candy product. So I'm gonna ask it about Pop Rocks. So Pop Rocks has a lot of different sweeteners added. So in addition to sucrose and corn syrup, which is basically every candy, it has lactose added. Let's see. Why is lactose added, ChatGPT? Um, it's listing. I think I just don't like that it always has a list. Like I just want like the answer and it's always throwing in these all these different bullet points. So none of these are what I was looking for. Like they're all just really general answers and it kind of just threw a lot of spaghetti against the wall. Uh, why lactose is added is it has a high glass transition temperature. It makes the hot pop rocks very hard and helps that hold in those carbon dioxide bubbles which are pressurized. Okay, here's another fun one. Carbo, I'm asking about cold flow, which is what carbo, even if it just sits out at room temperature, due to gravity, it might start to flow and deform and lose its shape. So I'm asking how to manipulate the formulation to prevent cold flow. Again, we got a long list. Okay, so water content, yep, that's right. Let's go to fat. So I don't really like what they have written here. Um, it's kind of getting along the right track, really what I would expect a good student to write is that you need to add more solid fat compared to liquid oil. And yeah, those ingredients could be cream or butter, but it seems like it doesn't understand the like underlying principle. So I would question that part of the answer. 
proteins is next. So, so this is wrong. Uh, this is just a really vague answer. What I wanted was for it to propose something like increasing the amount of casein. And lastly, we have sugar. So this sugar answer, it's really just repeating what it had for water content. It's not really telling me anything new about sugar. What I would have expected from like a very good student is they propose using ingredients, specific ingredients that inhibit cold flow. So overall, I'm not really jazzed about this answer. Um, it's just very vague. It's, it's so general. And there's just like a lot of BS within maybe one or two things that are actually correct. All right, let's talk about rock candy or I guess lack thereof. So I'm asking, you tried to make rock candy, right? You boiled your sugar syrup, evaporated some water, but later, you check a day later, no rock candy there. How is that possible? Let's see. I already see one of the answers I was looking for. That's you didn't reach a super saturated sugar solution. I don't see the second answer I was looking for. It, it gets close, but it's very, very general. Uh, but it would be that you use the wrong sugar ingredients. You use too much invert sugar or corn syrup versus sucrose. So this is maybe half right. Well, I have good news for the food scientists out there. That was only two questions entirely cracked. So I don't think we need to be worried about being replaced. ChatGPT is not great at taking multiple ideas and extrapolating them into the real world. Like if I give it a scenario that a food scientist might actually come across. It doesn't really know the answer. It just gives you a very long laundry list of some kind of correct and some totally wrong ideas. And I'm sorry, ChatGPT, you did not earn your bachelor's degree in food science. If you like this video, I have to recommend you check out my other video on how CRISPR technology is revolutionizing the food supply.